When the ice has formed and thickened on the lakes of Kulba Township, there is a day when people come from all over to experience and commemorate a past time. The ice harvesting industry reigned here in Kulba Township from the turn of the century into the 1930s. By the early 1950s, new technology eradicated the need to harvest natural ice, marking the end of an era. To the people of Kulba Township, and to those that travel here to take part in the act of remembrance and preservation, this day is a tribute to the near lost art of ice harvesting. Today, we take for granted the ability to grab a cool drink, to preserve produce, meat, and dairy, but before refrigeration, this required actual ice, harvested naturally from lakes and ponds in winter. Ice harvesting was a big business. Naturally harvested ice was used to pack fresh produce for shipment to urban markets and also delivered directly to consumers for use in their ice boxes. The ice harvesting industry came to the Poconos just as timber resources had been exhausted. Around 1885, Toby Hanna Mills, as it was known, had available infrastructure, equipment, and workers that could easily be transitioned to harvest ice. This new pursuit was brought on by a string of mild winters in the Northeast. The winters of 85, 86, and on into 87 were very mild winters on the East Coast. This stimulated the North Jersey Ice Company that had been a major supplier to begin to look for other sources. They began to negotiate with the lumber company that was shutting down in this area to purchase their equipment and facilities. The result was the formation of the North Jersey and Pocono Ice Company in 1886. And it was a pretty good business deal because within two years they doubled the value of their investment. Ice harvesting proved to be a successful venture. A group of investors from Scranton purchased the North Jersey and Pocono Ice Company in 1900, renaming it the Mountain Ice Company. That same year, the American Ice Company, a monolith of the industry, tried to purchase Mountain Ice for $2 million but the owners refused. The Mountain Ice Company quickly became the largest provider of natural ice in the Northeast. To more accurately represent itself, Toby Hanna Mills changed its name to the town of Toby Hanna. Lakes and ponds were plentiful in the Poconos. Some remained from the logging industry, but many were built specifically to harvest natural ice. Clean, abundant sources of water ensured the purity necessary for the task. 1902 saw an expansion in the Mountain Ice Company to both Lake Number 2, now the Tobihanna State Park Lake, and North Jersey, now the Goolsboro State Park. Other, smaller operations existed, some to supply the small local communities, some cut ice for personal use, or to sell to nearby boarding houses. Unlike timber, ice was renewed on a yearly basis. At the time, winters in the Poconos were cold enough to deliver reliable ice harvests every season. Jobs were plentiful, and people came from all over to work.
my dad had, had grown up in the area, and uh, this, uh, he had worked in the, in the ice industry here, right, in Mill Pond Number 1. He was a, called a chunk boy. He'd sit along the edge of the conveyor and pull off the bad chunks. For the Kubot Township Bicentennial back in 1994, my dad decided, hey, let's reenact an ice harvest. It is usually on the third Saturday in January that people gather here at Mill Pond No. 1 in the town of Toby Hanna. The ice harvest is sponsored by the Kuba Township Historical Association with the participation of the Leonard family. He had been collecting ice tools for years. Bill Leonard Sr. was one of many local residents that didn't want this proud tradition to fade away. The Conservation Club restored an insulated boxcar to store and display his collection. It had been a working ice car in the area and proved an appropriate home for safe storage and display. Much effort is required to get some of these machines up and running each year, but for this group, it is all about keeping the tradition alive. Toby Hanna Mill Pond number one here was originally dammed for the logging industry. Pocono Mountain Ice Company leased this pond from the Toby Hanna Lehigh Lumber Company in the late 1800s. They built a small ice house here and started harvesting ice. They used horses to pull the cakes up to the ice house. Then in 1907, they built a larger ice house. That ice house was 500 feet long, 100 feet wide, and 50 feet high. It had 10 rooms. It would hold 60,000 tons of ice. They say they used to start cutting ice the day after Christmas. Must have been colder back in those days. Now, this was not the only lake that ice was harvested from. Toby Hanna State Park was known as number two. There's Warnertown, Gooseboro, Pocono Lake. There's many ice houses in the area. Big demand for workers. Locals made up the year-round workforce, managing the lake and equipment in summer and filling ice cars when city supplies ran low. When harvest time came, local farmers and their horses came to work, as did hundreds of unemployed men from eastern cities. The outsiders, as they were called, arrived by rail from Scranton, Philadelphia, Hoboken, and New York some of them immigrants right off the boat. The ice harvesting companies built boarding houses on site to house the workers. And they referred to these areas as camps because in addition to the boarding house, you had a machine shop, because things were always breaking, a blacksmith, carpenter shop, and sometimes even a small store. A boarding house usually included two stories. The staff quarters would usually be for a local family or a group that would be hired to operate the boarding house. And then on the first floor would be a huge kitchen and a uh, living area for them. The workers' quarters were the second story and that was laid out in most instances like a long military barracks with uh, central aisles and then beds off to the right and, and left. In the rec room, you'd find men playing cards or table games, and they listened to the radio. And some played instruments. The family that operated the boarding house under contract with the owners uh, were expected to have breakfast 
by 4 a.m. and then they would pack a lunch for the men to take with them for the noontime break. And then of course there would be an evening meal and that usually came shortly after sundown. Pay was 30 cents if you worked on the ice and 35 cents if you worked in the ice house. The typical workday was 10 hours, Monday through Saturday. Conditions didn't always favor harvesting. The temperature could be too high or too low. So, when conditions were right, full advantage was taken. Men worked nights and Sundays when necessary. The work was hard and dangerous. The discomfort of working on ice in freezing temperatures was just the beginning. To slip and fall, to catch a foot in machinery, or a hand between ice blocks. All could be fatal. Men wore wool to protect against the weather and metal spikes to prevent slipping. But accidents did happen. When it's cold and your fingers aren't working and your toes aren't listening, uh, it's easy to get hurt. Injuries were frequent. The first step was to clear the ice of snow. This was done by a team of mules or horses that pulled a plow. Next, the ice would be marked off with a hand-pushed saw. Straight lines marked off even rectangles, 32 inches by 22 inches. Blocks were then cut partway through with a circular saw. Starting at the ice house, Huge strips of ice, 11 feet wide and 24 feet long, were sawed all the way through. These were called floats. As the floats were hauled into the ice house, a channel of open water would form by which successive floats could be guided in by men with ice hooks. As the floats reached the ice house, they were pushed under a water box. The water box was a dock-like structure built over the channel to support the men that would drive spud bars into the previously scored ice, reducing the floats into six block sections. These six block sections would be guided further down the channel and make a 90 degree turn towards the conveyor belt. In front of the conveyor belt, a man with a spud bar was poised on a plank to break off the individual blocks. Another man stood behind him to guide the finished blocks of ice onto the conveyor belt. The ice as it froze on the lake was anywhere from 16 inches to 30 inches, but the size of each cake had to be 14 inches, as was the standard ice box or refrigerator. In order to regulate the cake size, a planer equipped with knives was located on the incline. A proper sized cake was 22 by 32 by 14 and weighed 300 pounds. As the blocks approached the ice house, a man was stationed to hook the cake and slide it into the ice house. Blocks would run down a chute to a man called a switcher. The switcher would pivot the cake in one direction or the other to men called spacers who would pack them into rows with a four inch space in between each row to avoid cakes melting together. In the ice house, there would be two switchers, two spacers, a chunk boy who removed broken ice, and a room boss who would check the speed of approaching ice cakes and fill in where needed. Ice was simultaneously loaded on ice cars through the winter delivering fresh ice to major eastern cities. When the ice house was full, a plank floor was put on top of the ice and covered with sawdust. The rooms were then sealed tight. In 1902, when the industry was taking off in Kulba Township, ice was being produced for six cents per ton. 
The early 1920s marked the height of the ice industry. The American Ice Company employed 500 men a season. Between 75 and 100 railcar loads of ice were shipped daily from the Poconos to the large eastern cities. The need for naturally harvested ice would begin to slow in the 1930s. Some fella came along and uh, invented refrigerators, and that kind of put the end to the uh, cutting. Mass production of the electric refrigerator following World War II dealt the final blow to an already weakened market. Some operations harvested into the early 1950s, but they were strictly supplying ice for refrigerated boxcars. Nature, as it does, has reclaimed the land and water, leaving no trace of the once booming industry. If you are visiting one of the many beautiful lakes here in Kulba Township, you may come across some remains, a foundation peeking out, or a spud bar found along the shore, but mostly all that is left lives on in this commemoration. Revisiting the past, the good old days of ice harvesting in Kulba Township, reminds us that we have a proud heritage of working hard and earning a living from nature's bounty. Thanks to the stewards of this land and their knowledge, ice harvesting in Kulba Township will not be forgotten.